I started my career in television production. I worked uh, at uh, on Animal Planet and, and BBC documentaries. I moved into software. I set, started up a software company called Character Animation Technologies, and we built this rigging software that get used in the uh, video games industry. Uh, I, we sold that company to uh, Softimage here in Canada. So I moved to uh, Canada to work uh, on the Softimage team. I worked on the ICE project, which was really exciting, and got really involved in the film and visual effects industry. I started a company called Fabric Software, and we built tools for the visual effects industry. I have a big background in creature animation, uh, crowd simulation. I worked on the Warcraft movie, building the battle simulation software for the Warcraft movie. Um, and just through this history of uh, creature animation, uh, that sort of was, was my focus up until um, about 2015 when I founded the company Z. And I was looking to ch change direction, started up. We, initially, we just did a, a bunch of contracts uh, building software for local companies. And we started getting more and more pushed into the web. Um, we did one contract for a large engineering firm building a custom WebGL rendering engine for them. And the results were quite impressive. I was just amazed at how much performance we we're getting out of the web browser and how, how, how the quality of the tools there. So in, in about 2017, we started really shifting focus away from services and more towards building technology or a product. And we started developing our custom WebGL visualization engine. And at the time, we saw that most WebGL demos online were featuring really small data sets, like really small models of a few megabytes. Um, most of the files being loaded with JSON based, so very inefficient files are being loaded. And at the same time, there's this new API coming out called WebXR. And WebXR just allowed, it was pretty exciting. It allows VR directly in the browser. So that kind of really said, pushed us to build this rendering engine that could handle the largest models possible and at the highest frame rate possible, like as, as fast as possible, and support a range of other uh, features such as collaboration. Um, Victor? So our core technology, we have a high performance WebGL visualization engine, we call it Z Engine, which is um, the core of our technology. We have C++ SDKs that we run on the, on the server that can load a range of CAD file formats, like you know your, your proprietary CAD file formats and export really efficient optimized uh, file format for the web called the ZCAD file. Um, we have a cloud processing API that we're setting up allowing users to leverage our CAD file processing SDKs without actually uh, having the software on a computer, so you can just submit your CAD files to our cloud. And we also develop application templates, which will allow you to build your own custom web application uh, using our engine and drop it in uh, to get it up and running very quickly. And we, we leverage the Svelte framework for that. So the, our focus is really on serious applications or what we call professional graphics. So uh, next slide, Victor. Our customers are mostly in uh, these design and in engineering spaces. We have customers in automotive, uh, product lifecycle management. So that's like managing the data behind the scenes for uh, a design or a, a engineering firm. Parts catalogs, so basically uh, allowing people to be able to log on and purchase parts uh, after they've purchased a piece of equipment. Maintenance, repair and operations, so technical training, how to explaining how to disassemble or assemble something, uh, e-learning, and we have a, uh, some customers also in construction. So that the, the profile of these customers shows, you know, our focus is really on CAD uh, performance um, and, uh, and and making it really easy for these companies to get their data uh, online in, in an efficient way. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Uh, now we will move on to you towards uh, Pierre-Luc. So Pierre-Luc, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm uh, Pierre-Luc Lapointe from uh, OVA. Uh, uh, XR uh, product design and uh, R&D director. Uh, Ova is a company that has been uh, that is uh, that is there since uh, 2014, uh, and we are uh, uh, we are working uh, essentially uh, uh, building services and a product called Strix uh, that um, uh, that are uh, that that. Uh, I will say uh, leverage uh, VR, AR, and mixed reality technologies, including also AI, to uh, provide a uh, uh, training solution, immersive training solution, also immersive experiences solution that, uh, that uh, can be uh, used for uh, both uh, soft skill and hard skill use cases. And uh, yeah, so essentially our mission is, is to uh, 
um, is to be able to uh, to make uh, immersive experience uh, accessible to everyone. And uh, our main focus is for companies, for businesses. And uh, we uh, we worked with a lot of partners and a lot of uh, with a lot of clients from many fields. Uh, uh, we work with uh, Hydro Quebec, Bombardier. Uh, also, uh, we worked we worked with uh, Post Canada, Institut des Mines, Nikon. Uh, we also worked, for example, uh, with uh, with the Pinel Institute uh, um, for um, for mental illness uh, to be able to build an application, an immersive application to uh, um, uh, to uh, work with. Uh, um, uh, schizophrenia to be able to uh, be able to visualize uh, visualize inner voices with uh, with uh, with people uh, that have that uh, mental illness. So uh, there, there's a lot of fields and a lot of use cases that are very really interesting, but uh, that can be uh, can be explored with uh, VR, AR, and mixed reality technologies. Uh, with Sterix, we aim to provide the tools. And also all the environments uh, for people to, to create their own uh, training experiences and uh, immersive experiences. So it can be uh, uh, can be for um, uh, a specific business such as Bombardier. It could be also for for a school with a teacher that would like to to show uh, um, to be able to show to their students how to. Uh, how to uh, to uh, to repair a, a plane engine, for example. Also, it could be for soft skill uh, soft skill building. Also, and uh, we work with uh, with a lot of 3D assets. So uh, sometimes large 3D assets, sometimes smaller. Uh, we work with uh, uh, sometimes with AV environments. Also, uh, animated object uh, a lot, uh, but not only visual. We also work with uh, audio effects. And uh, we are multimodal, so we want to be able to allow people to access our software. Uh, it could be, for example, from a, from a VR headset. Also, it could be from a desktop computer, from a laptop. And uh, we want to provide the best user experience so, uh, as possible. And uh, yeah, so uh, we work with, with a lot of type of data. And uh, we provide uh, so we provide uh, a lot of tools that, that allows people to uh, to uh, uh, be more efficient with uh, creating those kind of experiences. Thank you, thank you, Pierre Luc. Uh, that was very insightful. And uh, now we are moving on to uh, Antoine. So Antoine, who conducted a study on uh, different three uh, D uh, visual visualization uh, render. So Antoine, you have the floor. Was, hello, sorry, I was mute. Um, as uh, hello, as mentioned, I'm a graphics programmer at Cedrin, um, which is a research center based in the province of Quebec. You can do the next slide, Victor. And we work on a bunch of different projects. Um, mostly, I mostly work in the in the the three D projects we have. So, uh, could be helping video game studios to improve some some lighting task or graphic programming related could be related to volumetric rendering in in a case of some project we've done remodeling stuff in 3d um yeah we do a lot of project and for this project uh with z you can press next slide victor we um <clears throat> we basically tested the different and mostly the the form main like we basically tested rendering to benchmark um to see the performances of um of how web browser would be able to render high amount of 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 triangles and and very huge scenes so we tested uh, on this little scene you can check on the right which is a, a bunch of boxes that has like random tessellation materials applied to each box and we started with 100 bucks and we went all the way up to 100,000 boxes, which has a, like a lot of data to render. And we we basically tested the renderer using using it very raw in the way that we haven't made any optimization at all. We just took the file, we throw it into the renderer, 
and we compare it to see like, how do you do without any optimization? So if you were to test the same data or you would to use those, probably if you have like tweaking around, there's like some uses technique to, to make the thing better, but we really tested using it like in like very, okay, here's the data, here it is raw. And we tested on a, on a somehow like decent com gamer computer from like two or three years like old. So like GTX 10, 1070, you can do the next uh, slide, Victor. And as you can see, <clears throat> um, most of the renderer does well, like at the beginning, but when we start to reach around 40K, that's where you see it becomes very, very, very uh, inefficient for most of, of those. Like we use um, like some that were open source. Uh, we use one that was a private one. And we also in blue, uh, see, we can see that the, it, the in blue, it's, it's Z. And then the other colors are like the other solutions on the market. And we can see that Z is extremely well suited to render high amount of like I amount of, of, of geometries in the scene. And yeah, so I guess, um, Philip, if you want to, to jump, because there, I know there's a video later, so. No, thank you. That's all good. So um, yeah, to, for, for this presentation, we, we have this data set, which is um, a piece of mining equipment uh, that was provided to us for testing um, by a company called PulsePLN. Um, and so this data set comes directly out of the product lifecycle management software. It's just raw data. It's, this is the data on it, it that's used during the manufacturing process. Uh, and there was no changes or optimizations made to this data at all. Uh, we simply loaded into our engine to to visualize it. And as part of the test, we wanted to show that we could get kind of VR uh, frame rates. So here we've got a couple of users. Uh, there's me on the right hand side there and uh, Pierre Luc is on the left side. And we're exploring this, um, this data set in VR and having a conversation, as you can see, lots of hand waving and, and gesturing. Um, this data set is about a one gigabyte uh, source data set. Um, so quite heavy take quite a long time to load, but uh, we processed it through our uh, software. It comes out as about 20 megabytes uh, in the form of a ZCAD file. Um, I just also should mention it says 17,000 parts in this uh, data set. So 17,000 parts is right on that graph where, you know, most of the renders are starting to struggle. We're getting 10 to 20 frames per second uh, in the best case. We actually did load this, this, this same data set into a 3JS best renderer just to see what would happen. And, and we got about three or four frames per second uh, on a good computer. So to support VR, just to give you some details, we re you really need about 90 frames per second. And you actually also have to render the scene once for each eye. So you're looking at more like 180 frames per second is what you really need for, for a VR um, experience to be, to be decent. And in this case, you know, we're getting, we're, we're getting a solid, uh, solid steady uh, experience. So, uh, you know, th this just kind of shows the kind of things you can do when you can achieve that kind of performance. You can ex take this raw data and throw it into a VR experience and have multiple people exploring it. Um, there's a misconception that people have with, when it comes to rendering that you're mostly constrained by the number of triangles. And it's, it's only true, like in some scenarios, when you get to these really big data sets, as soon as you get past 3,000 parts, to be honest, you're starting to be constrained more by the number of parts in the scene than the number of triangles. Um, and so uh, most renderers start uh, struggling because they really were designed around this fairly small number of parts, each part having many triangles. Whereas in these data sets we get from in the CAD world are mostly many thousands of small parts, each with a, just a, a small number of triangles. Um, so you, there's no point in trying to, uh, like you optimizing and reducing the number of triangles really won't change your performance too much if you're already bottlenecked uh, by the renderer, by the number of parts. Um, yeah, so we actually tried also as an experiment, we, this data set exported to GLTF. So just, it started off as a one gigabyte uh, CAD file, exported to GLTF or GLB, I should say. It was about uh, 270 megabyte GLTF file. So that's really a little bit too much to load into the browser. And it's 270 megabytes, you can't ask somebody to wait for five minutes while their, their web page loads. Whereas uh, as ZCAD, it's, it's, um, 20 megabytes and it's, stream, it's a streamed loading solution as well. So, you know, you get to see this, this vehicle load. Um, that really uh, makes it more, much more of a, a solution that we can use in, in the web than 
so, so GLTF is a great format. It's very powerful. It has a lot of powerful features, but it doesn't really scale well to these massive CAD models, which is why we really, we do have our own custom file format. And what were the challenge, Philip, when implementing these, these type of uh, like conversion or what kind of process you went through developing your own uh, file format? Yeah, when we started, um, we were the first problem was how do you load a CAD file? These CAD files, they're, they need C++ SDKs. There are a lot of proprietary for formats. So we looked around online and we started investigating which SDKs we could use to open the CAD file format. And then uh, when we first started, we didn't actually, we weren't looking at GLTF. So we just decided, okay, we needed our own file format. Um, so we, we wrote our own tools to analyze this data and export our own custom ZCAD file. One of the things we were we started doing initially was like, how can we reduce the size of these files because they're pretty they become really huge very quickly. And so, our software analyzes the file, looks for duplication, so it can notice that that two parts are actually identical, even though they don't they're they're different in the file. You can say, oh, they're identical. So it actually automatically starts creating instancing in the background. It will share parts. Like one example was. Uh, there's a grill where every there's a bunch of uh, rows of louvers on the grill. They might be showing up as separate geometries, but our analyzer will see that they're all just one one geometry, and it'll just store only one copy and an instance the rest. So that's one thing that that's where we're leveraging the nature of the data. We know that this data is CAD data. It's very regular. It's often very repetitive, and we can use that to, that knowledge to optimize the data further. Is there is there any uh, uh, conversion uh, conversion process happening to uh, to make the uh, the CAD data uh, be uh, as efficient as it is in the, in the engine? Well, I think you know even two CAD file files which store the same data can be quite different in size. We've we've found that if we convert it from one CAD file to another, we still got a big difference in size. So the efficiency of each file format is different. Every file format will be say focused on different qualities and because we wanted to build a fairly minimal file format that was just as efficient as possible, um, even though we store mostly the same data that's in the, in the original format, it's just the one thing is the efficiency drives it to become smaller. We also reduce um, precision. So a lot of CAD file formats store everything in 64-bit floating point numbers, which that's the, they need that much accuracy for the CAD applications, but for visualization purposes, that's just way too much. So we have all sorts of optimizations. And in most cases, we store 32-bit values or 8-bit values to, and, and all sorts of compression on top of that to, to reduce the size of the data. Okay. Antoine, when you were doing the study, you know, um, what, was, what was the thing that you came out of the study learning? Like, what was your biggest learning when you were doing the study? Uh, well, setting up the thing was uh, for, especially for, um, Coming like sometimes when you work, uh, I mostly have a like game <clears throat> and or real time gaming like uh, graphics background. And when dealing with CAD, there was like some new file for new tools I haven't really explored. So <clears throat> sorry. So that was one thing. But I also learned that actually the web is doing like for me rendering in the web was like why would someone do that? And when I started to test those tools, I was <clears throat> very impressed by how actually web was like basically how web gl was was good i know there are some like you don't have access to all the, the the same thing as if you were doing an open gl project but it's still very impressing that as we saw in the video like you just throw a link and then everyone is opening a browser and woo, everything is set up and ready to go so i was I learned, yeah, that was my biggest learning is that, oh, WebGL is actually a thing. What do you think in the future would be the, the, the future of GPU on the web for you, Philippe? When we started, we were working against WebGL 1. So WebGL 1 is very basic, and we, we were quite excited when WebGL 2 came along and opened up new doors for us. And we immediately started trying to take advantage of the new features in WebGL 2. Building on the web is challenging because... Um, some browsers are more powerful than others. Safari, for example, even today, Safari doesn't support WebGL 2. That's a real challenge for us because we have to now support both WebGL 1 and WebGL 2, and we can't really optimize completely around sort of one sort of API. But that's just the nature of our, our job. What's interesting coming going forward is that there's a new API coming out called WebGPU, which has a lot of new features, which uh, like as Anton was saying, 
in the browser today, we are kind of limited. We can't do all of the cool stuff you could do in a desktop renderer. Like if you're writing shaders, say for Unity, there's all these powerful features that we just can't, can't leverage. But that's all going to change in the next year. Uh, WebGPU is coming out. It supports a lot of new powerful sh shader types. Um, WebGPU is designed around performance. So you know those graphs that we were looking at earlier? Um, as a lot of these rendering engines, the web-based ones anyway, as they move to um, WebGPU, we, we expect some movement. We expect some of them to get a lot faster and more efficient. And obviously, that's going to make our job more challenging. If we want to continually maintain a performance advantage, we have to work harder. And that's, that is our goal. Um, the web GPU you know, is going to open up a lot of new opportunities for graphics developers on the web. Pierre, look, I know you've, you guys have done a bit of work with 5G and uh, server-side rendering. Uh, what are your experiences with, with 5G and server-side rendering? How, how do you think it's going to change your business? Well, uh, on our side, it, it was really uh, it was really interesting to see that there, there's a lot of, of potential in being able to leverage uh, uh, remote computing server side render and rendering to be able to display uh, uh, really AV, uh, AV scenes in in uh, relatively low end devices such as the Quest Two without having to have to have a sp specific build of let's say Star X for example to run on, on the Quest Two, so being able to access a desktop version of it uh, with really high end visual, it's what was really uh, really interesting for us. And what we see in that is that uh, at the end of the day, the, the data is really important. So whatever the data is, the end goal is to be able to have that kind of client fluid uh, experience where whether you access it from a low end device such as the Quest 2, or it could be also a laptop or a tablet, uh, you can have, you, you still have an optimized and, uh, and uh, uh, really uh, uh, yes, a, a really, really optimized experience when, access, when, when accessing your data, whatever the, the, the whatever the, the device is, the client is. So, at the end of the day, I, I think there, there's a lot of potential in, a lot of potential in that. Maybe I can comment on that because what we have to deal with on our side in our job is we have to deal with all of the thousands of different devices that people might be using. And we have to try and make an engine that runs on all of these devices mm -hmm. and different networking conditions and so on. So we, we really uh, deal with the complexity on the client side. Server-side rendering, what Pierre Luc is talking about, is moving all the rendering right to the server and keeping it there. You don't really need to do much on the client. It, simpl it simplifies a lot what you have on the client. You're, the client is just a like a video stream of what's actually being rendered on the server. So it's like ne Netflix for, for, for real-time 3D. Um, so it moves complexity to the server. So that can complicate a company's infrastructure. Like now you have to manage uh, these servers in, this, in the cloud and, and there's costs to running these servers, which are not high, but they're not zero. So it kind of impacts your business models, like how you, how you can scale a business is impacted. And it also, your, the access to clients is very dependent on their bandwidth, like their data speed. Um, so, if everybody gets 5G, then we're, you know, server-side rendering is, is a great solution. But um, it's going to take about, you know, a good 10 years for server-side uh, 5G to roll out broadly. And in that time, you know, uh, server-side rendering, I, I think is, its time has come. It's really, I've seen a few impressive examples of server-side rendering. Um, but we believe there's always going to be a case where client-side rendering using WebGL and using the browser kind of wins mostly because of the cost factor. It just... It drives down cost on the business side. So, you, you know, you can scale something at, uh, as, to as many users as you want without any sort of incremental costs. I, I totally agree, and I think that both uh, uh, both uh, solution can exist, can coexist uh, organically. Uh, it could be also uh, there's also challenges regarding uh, uh, sometimes just the the secu security level and the security concerns of an organization of a business, let's say, that want to operate really locally uh, in the, in the, uh, without having to rely on the cloud service. So there, there's, there's a lot of situation where, where, you, where, where you will need also a, a client computing. So uh, there, there is a, I, I think there, there is a, a place for, for, both, uh, for, 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 for both solutions for sure. And Antoine, you know, I think you were talking earlier a little bit about the sort of the different focus of, say, games 
a games focused engine versus something more designed for CAD. So what would you say is the main difference between say games engine versus like say a CAD visualization engine? Well, as we talk in games, the number one thing is to get the eyes of the player. You want the thing to be beautiful and interactive and you use like acts or techniques to make always graphics better and or to fit the certain type of the game it's very artistic driven when it comes to visual effects and you program those effects based on the look and feel of the game well in cad uh, i was surprised like there's not even shadows and i'm like oh there's no shadow why is there but then you mentioned to me it's like well in cad people they don't that much they, they care about high amount of geometries while in in video games we do care about that too but it seems like the like in cad people are less oriented so they just want the things to be quick fast it works it shows on the screen like even in the video you show like uh, what did, what type of lighting did you do what were the did you have texture did you made the what what was the pro the processing of, of uh... well it's interesting um shadows is an interesting one uh, materials is more complicated um, materials, so the, the CAD file we loaded had some basic coloring, um, some, some basic materials. I've seen CAD files coming from some manufacturers where they actually encode custom information in the colors. Like the color actually means something. It could specify uh, like a process that's applied to this product when it's being manufactured. So the colors are not there to look good. They're, look, they're, they're there to convey information. And so, uh, you know, th there's just that completely different focus here with this data. Um, our renderer does support normal mapping and PBR materials. We even support loading Unity materials into our engine. But to be honest, most of the data we get doesn't have texture coordinates. So there's not much you can do with text without texture coordinates. Um, and if you've got 17,000 parts in a model, you're not going to st start spending time assigning texture coordinates. So, so we, um, the demos we mostly have are just uh, very raw geometries with, uh, we use image-based lighting. So there's an a, there's a HDR image that provides a, a lighting environment, which makes things kind of look shiny and it can really help you, your eye distinguish the curvature. Um, I think there's cases where materials do have a functional uh, uh, value, like shadows, for example, can actually tell you the relationship between two objects, seeing how far apart they are and contact shadows help you identify that two objects are touching Whereas with no shadows at all, you can't obviously just, it's not easy to see that just by looking at it. I think in the future, we will support shadows. Especially uh, in VR. VR, like when you need to drag and drop stuff, could be so helpful to just have a shadow. You're like, okay, now I'm on the table or well, yeah. That's a good example of where VR, uh, the, the shadows add, add, do add value. There's a few questions coming in on the question uh, chat panel, by the way, guys. Oh. Um, if you don't mind, I will, I will, I will ask them. So. The first questions we got from Nathan Barnes was, what applications do you see for augmented reality? Maybe Pierre, you can answer that one. Yeah, uh, so there, there, there's a lot of, uh, of application that, uh, uh, that could benefit from, um, let's say, for example, uh, um, I see a lot, a lot of possibility for medical application, for example, where, where you need to perform some uh, um, uh, some surgery uh, and and do some training for surgery, for example, it could be also for uh, for emergencies. Uh, I think there's a lot of possibilities uh, in that. Um, also for man manufacturing, uh, a lot of things with manufacturing, and it's it's really uh, uh, and, and it depends also of the use case. So so uh, if if there is a, a maybe a, a, with a, a manufacturing use case with R skill stuff. Maybe there's there's also that aspect of, of that digital twin. So where you have, for example, a game object, uh, not a game object, I mean an object, a 3D, a 3D asset somewhere of, uh, of let's say a machine that you have in your, in, uh, in your factory. And, and then it, re it resides somewhere in the, maybe uh, on a server or so, somewhere. And then you can, you can have access to that, to that engine and make modification and use it for different use cases. Let's say, for example, you use that engine, and uh, that uh, I mean that machine, in the, uh, for uh, for um, to be able to visualize where that machine will go in the factory. So then you take that information from the from the data or server and then display it in augmented reality, and then be able to visualize where the, where that machine will go. 
that is one use case, for example. And what is interesting also is not only not only augmented reality, but also mixed reality, and being able to cross uh, uh, to cross technologies. And uh, let's say, for example, you have that same machine, and then someone has to operate on that machine and do uh, maybe do some training stuff, and then you have you, you have uh, someone else remotely in VR, uh, looking at the same machine, looking at the same machine and maybe the same space. And maybe there's a 3D, uh, 3D representation of that space. And then both can work together and have, uh, have their, their rendering, their, their view stream to each other and be able to help each other. So it's really about, I, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of possibility in, in the access of the, of the places with with the with augmented reality, you are there. You are you are at, uh, you, you are um, you are um, in the place. With virtual reality, you are you, you are not in the place. You access to a remote representation of, of that place. But I think I think there's a lot of potential of when, when you cross uh, those those technology together to to create a really a, a really. A, uh, really immersive, special, and collaborative experience. This is this is wh where I see a lot of use cases. The next question is asked by uh, Pierre Olivier, who asks: If the engine is fully available on GitHub under a AGPL license, it's often scary for a private company to take something so core to their business as their in-house engine and open it to the public. What was the drive to engage on that path for Z, and how is the how has been experience so far? I think it's for you, Philip. Yeah, sure, thank you. Uh, initially, we were anxious about going open source. I mean, you're kind of opening yourself up to anybody to look at your code, every single change. Like, sometimes we're like embarrassed that we made a mistake and we're fixing it. Like, everybody can see everything you're doing, but it kind of forces us a form of honesty and it's also a way of connecting more closely with your clients. So. You know, we're working on a, on a feature, we can let people know, here's the branch that we're working on, you can follow along at home. Um, by the way, it's a dual license, there's an AGPL license and a commercial license. Um, so AGPL is really good for non-commercial applications like educational, you know, if you're using it um, for a non-commercial application, AGPL is a good license, but it really is a barrier for people to use um, AGPL, AGPL code in a, in a commercial context. It's possible, but it's most, most companies would avoid it. So that's why there's a second license there. It, it actually has been helpful. Like so, so far, it's been nice to be able to send people links to our actual source code, not have to, um, you know, having everything behind a wall was actually a hindrance to communicating with the clients. Um, and I think there's also this thing that nobody's gonna take the time to steal your code anyway. Uh, most companies are really busy. Um, I think there's a few things in, the, in our code that we're like, oh, we're really proud of that thing. Hopefully, you know, people don't come and see that and, and steal it. But I think, to be honest, um, uh, if that happens, it's probably unlikely to have a big impact on us as a company. Um, we have a mixture of where there's some of our code is still private. We the code that loads a Zcat file um, is some of parts of it are still private, and that's actually because we're we are concerned about security. Uh, we want to make sure the Zcat file actually has some security features built into it. Um, so we'd like it to be possible to have. Um, and code uh, ways them to lock a file and prevent uh, unauthorized access. So for that, we kind of do need to keep some aspects of our source code private. Um, but probably we're, we're at like a good 90% uh, of our source code is, is public and available online now. So it's been a really positive experience. We've had companies say that they would really only deal with open source code. And it's becoming a modern kind of policy within some big enterprises that they want to only use open source code. And I think it's just because it gives them that level of confidence that they can, if this company decide to stop supporting some software, they could just take it and keep maintaining it themselves. So it was after some of these conversations, we decided to really embrace open source and, and go all in. Great, thank you. Oh, thanks for that. <laughs> so Nathan has, a, has another question. How much of a trade-off of performance with shared resources would there be for AR? Would this limit the size of the model or would this limit the size of the meshes? So AR, um, there's, there's a range of AR hardware. Uh, you've got the HoloLens, which is like this kind of high-end expensive headset. A lot of when people say AR, I think they're referring to like using a mobile device. 
where there's a camera on the front and there's sort of a bit of tracking technology built into these modern devices that allow you to track your, your phone's position. So then when we, if we put into that context, we're aiming at what can you display on a mobile device? Like what could you get on an iPad or, a, or your phone? And luckily these devices are getting faster and faster every year. They're, they're constantly getting faster and the APIs that we work with get, get more efficient. So we've got these two things kind of converging, which means that you know, we would, our goal, <laughs> our goal is that, that that mining equipment would run on your phone. And that's our, our goal. We're not there yet. It's gonna be a couple of years, but our goal is that you can load massive, massive data sets and they, they run fine on your phone. Um, one of, there's so many ways that you can speed up a render that, that we still haven't even started looking at. So um, right now, I think uh, the limit is, you, you know, one tenth of that model might run on your phone, but not the whole thing. Um, and there's various things that would, would go wrong. Like your phone would just crash if you tried to load that vehicle on your phone. Uh, I have a question and, and uh, please, uh, uh, every, every participant, every attendees can jump in, ask a question. Uh, I mean, the floor, the floor is open for question. I have a question about uh, maybe for Philip or Pierre-Luc or even Antoine, um, with the development of 5G technologies, what is the future of what you envision in terms of uh, 3D rendering on 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 the on the uh, on you know the web browser, is it how will it evolve? And uh, can you maybe expand on that? Uh, for gaming, I think what would be nice, and we already see it, is with services like like uh, not, not Strava, Strava's for by like a uh, Google Stadia. So like you basically, as Philip mentioned. It's like a stream. So all the rendering is done on a server somewhere and you receive, it's like the Netflix of gaming or so. For CAD and stuff, I'd probably let Philip and Pialuk expand on this. Yeah, I've seen some demos of some pretty huge CAD models being loaded on a server. Uh, you can, the demos you see online, you always have to have this question, like how far are they from the server? Like what kind of network did they have? Because sometimes I've seen demos where I think they were like literally next, next door to the server. <laughs> And I had a demo where I contacted them straight away. I said, I want to try your demo. Can I try it, please? And they said, oh, where are you? I said, I'm in Montreal. And I said, oh, you're a bit too far away. I'm like, okay, well, what was the point in that thing? Like, I have to be in Los Angeles to, to, to use your server. But I think that was a few years ago. I think things are changing now. Um, 5G basically makes it that you should be pr pretty much every, anywhere and be able to access this kind of really high, high stream of data from a server. Um, I know Starlink is another technology which is pretty interesting. Starlink from like um, Elon Musk's company that they promise some pretty massive data bandwidths too. So you could be on a ship way out in the ocean and access uh, like a live stream of data from from a server here in here in Montreal. So yeah, or imagine like you are you mentioned you are on a boat somewhere and okay like we're just like we're imagining a, a story like a story here but like you're on a boat in the middle of nowhere there's a piece broken on the boat you could just download it 3d print it and like oh you're fixed you no know, the, the the sip won't sink it won't won't sink i don't know if it's something like that happens every day but it's like there are so many use cases where like democratization of like more connecting more humans on the internet together is for me just will bring more positive too yeah yeah it's 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 part of so of a larger project which is uh uh ubiquitous computing which is about the being able to have that ambient computing thing where there's there's computing anywhere everywhere so you can have access uh whatever you are on the ship on the ship or Whatever you are in a city or somewhere in a, in a, in a, in a town, uh, you can have access to, to any kind of data, whatever the size, whatever the nature of that data is, you still can have access to, uh, to that data, whatever the device, you access it also. So it's like, the, it's like if we move the, the, uh, but the data is, that, is at the center, is at the core of that project where the client are just fluid uh elements that are moving uh, can be can be changed uh yes. at any time and i'm but i'm still wondering to like what's gonna be the real like <clears throat> application on a day-to-day -day basis because i see sometimes people talking about like 
oh, everything's going to be connected. And then, oh, I'm going to have my, my intelligent watch that tells me if I have a disease. Like, this is all good on papers, but sometimes it's pr in practice. I like this meme where it's like AI and it's like there's an image of a dog and a cat and it's like the AI doesn't work. I mean, sometimes I'm wondering, like, <clears throat> when will we have all this? Like, would it be in... 10 years, five years. I don't know. I'm just like opening philosophical question here. <laughs> there, there's a tipping point that maybe we, we haven't quite reached yet, but um, like I've been following the, you know, the 5G story and the server side rendering for a while. And, you know, we've put our, we put our um, emphasis on client side rendering mainly because it's available now. Like it works today out of the box. It just works. We're not waiting for some technology to come along and change things. But we also know that there could be a moment where that, that transition is happening and we need to adapt. So um, uh, I think for now, there's still a lot of uh, value in, this, in, in the client-side rendering. But once everybody has one gigabit internet connections on their phone, wherever they are, like, what does that change? Like suddenly, you know, there, there will be a shift in focus. Like just like when we move from DVDs to Netflix, there, there's a there's a moment that becomes possible. And after that, you know, before and after are like a two different But worlds. both can live together too. Like I know some people don't listen DVD anymore, but like you can still buy a DVD player. But I mean, I don't know. It, 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 it's, it's interesting. I'm wondering if one day everything is going to be server side rendering. We'll see. <laughs> There's a question here, an uh, anonymous uh, attendee who is asking, what's the big, I think it's for Philip, what's the biggest file you've ever loaded in the in the browser? Oh, that's a good one. Um, we, we ourselves <laughs> struggle to find files big enough to, to challenge our renderer. To be honest, we, you know, we spend days looking through Gribecad and these other websites trying to find big files and none of them come close to what our customers actually have. So this this uh, mining equipment is one gigabyte. That was big, but actually we have assets. Uh, we've clients got that load more like six gigabytes of data. So um, even the same company that provided that mining equipment, that's one of their smaller models. They've got a range of bigger and bigger models and they all look, get bigger. They're just monsters at, at the end. And so, um, yeah, those, those five and a half gigs is about the, the, where I know we've hit that limit. It's interesting because we ask ourselves, what is the limit? Like, what is the top, top maximum before we just can't load anymore? And right now we do run out of memory in the browser. The browser just kind of has this limit how much memory it can load before it just crashes. And it's about four gigabytes of memory. You can't use more than four gigabytes before it just crashes. So you do everything you possibly can to reduce the amount of memory you're using so that you can load more. But there's actually not much we can do to reduce memory either, like we're using JavaScript. But there's a new technology coming called assembly script, which actually, or sorry, WebAssembly, which we're starting to look at very closely. And what WebAssembly does is gives us the ability to more precisely control how much memory we're using. We can use a lot less memory, like we're talking one tenth of as much memory and load much bigger files much faster. So that, for, that, that um, piece of mining equipment loads in about 20 seconds with our engine today. Uh, maybe it's more like 10 seconds. I'm not sure exactly. But with this WebAssembly uh, version, we've started tinkering, we've done experiments. It should load in about be between half a second and one second. It should that load that fast. So we're talking a a another 10x faster load times than what we can do today. And the memory, like uh, we're only using about, I think we should only use about 500 megabytes of RAM to load that same vehicle in WebAssembly. Compared to right now, it's almost four gigs. So suddenly, um, well, actually, I don't know what we're, it's not using four gigs because I know we can load a lot more, but when we move to WebAssembly, suddenly the limits that we have today will just be lifted by at least 10 times more. So, you know, suddenly the problems we will face will be once we've got so much data, like let's say we could put 10 gigabytes of data in the browser. That's just, that's just too much data to render. We now need to look at other problems like how to reduce the amount of geometry that's being loaded according to what you can see and, and other, and other criteria. Thank you, Philip. Uh, next question comes from Mraza, who asks, what do you think about deploying 3D assets to mobile web browsers? What are the challenges to do that? So um, interestingly on mobile, we've, we're really dominated by two operating systems, Android and iOS. And 
with Android, they have really, the, the Chrome browser in Android is actually almost as fully featured as the one on desktop. It can do almost all the same things. It's really not limited at all. But Safari has been heavily limited for the longest time. So when it comes to mobile, it's always, it's always Safari. Like, what can we do in Safari? What can we do to get Safari to load the data? Um, but that's changing, actually. Just last week, we saw finally announced that Safari is doing a huge upgrade. I think the, 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 the beta is available now. You can test it out. But um, I think it's by September, October, they're, they're going to be releasing a Safari version 15, or is iOS 15, the Safari, uh, this big update to Safari. And suddenly, it's going to be on par with Chrome. Um, so we're, we're going to expect um, to be able to handle these much bigger files um, uh, in, in the mobile browsers as well. Of course, the performance of a mobile GPU is much, much lower. So we're going to have just loading the data is the first problem. But if you can't render it at a decent frame rate, then then you haven't achieved very much. So the part of the problem is then trying to figure out how to more intelligently render a scene. Right now, we're doing what's called a brute force renderer. We just throw everything at the GPU as hard as we possibly can, and we just let it go. So we're we're not doing intelligent things. Like we are cut. If something gets really small on screen, like if a little bolt gets far away, we stop rendering it. We know that if it falls below a certain threshold, we stop rendering it. And that gives us about a 30% boost in performance. So um, that portafill scene, actually, we got about 40 frames per second before we enable this optimization. It goes up to 60 and it was fast enough for, for VR. Um, the other thing we need to be able to do is what's called occlusion culling which is where if you've got something that's in front of something else, it'd be good if we could stop rendering the thing that's being occluded or hidden by that thing in front. Occlusion culling promises that you could then load much bigger scenes because most of the objects are either off screen, like they're not in front of you, so you can't see them, or they're being hidden by something else. And so you start hitting this point where you can actually load infinite geometries because you can only really see a maximum number of geometries at any moment. You can't see everything. It's, there's always something hidden or or off screen. So once we can do occlusion culling, uh, I expect that's where we can run the port of that, that uh, piece of equipment, which is called the port of fill. We could run that uh, on a mobile device. Okay, next question from uh, another anonymous attendee. Um, I think it's also for Philip. Uh, you mentioned RAM and GPU requirements. Which type of memory affects what? Um, so you've got GPU memory, which is how much. So when we're loading, uh, I mentioned earlier, there's a four gigabyte limit. That's in the main memory. So that's the memory that's used to store the scene. And then there's GPU memory, which is usually textures and geometries and things like that, which you put into the GPU. And once they're in the GPU, you start, you start the rendering process. Um, most games have massive textures. Like you'll see, they just use really massive textures. So because we're not doing lots of texturing, we actually have plenty of GPU memory spare. We're not, we're not really pushing the limits of the GPU in terms of memory. Most of our limitations are more, more on like the, the size of the scene tree. If you started, started putting in massive texture, like a 4K texture will weigh as much as lot, millions upon millions of triangles. So, so one texture can be, can be quite expensive to load compared to the, the geometry. Pia, look, I assume you guys deal with huge textures a lot. Yes, we have to deal with uh, with the large textures uh, often, and uh, yes, this is the, it's uh, it's 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 uh, one of the challenges that we face. Um, but I still think that that uh, one of uh, one of the way one of the meta that can be used to uh, at least in in terms of technology that 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 we could leverage to optimize. Also, all, all those processes are, are uh, it's, uh, it's artificial intelligence. I, I think that we saw a lot of a lot of examples recently where artificial intelligence was was involved with uh, with uh, rendering uh, what seems to be a, 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 a hyper realistic scene of uh, at a really really decent frame rate. Uh, I remember that that what we saw with. Uh, the example, the example from GTA, uh, Grand Theft Auto, where, where you have uh, the in-game rendering of all the scene, everything with all the textures, and then you have that that AI-driven uh, representation where you have that reconstruction of the scene, all all the view with uh, pretty realistic rendering with with uh, texture and stuff like that, and all the reflection. 
So um, it's still, it's the, still there is a long way to go with that, but I think that there's a lot of potential also with, with uh, AI-driven uh, rendering. If we can continue, we have two more questions. Uh, I'll go with the first one with uh, Nikita, who is asking, I wonder how well it could work on uh, Apple's M1 chip. It might be tricky because it has unified memory and serves as a GPU as well. Yeah, and so Apple started developing their own GPUs. Uh, they announced this a couple of years ago and every sent the graphics world into a buzz. And um, this is one reason why I'm excited about the future. Apple is finally taking the web more seriously. They've invested heavily in WebGPU, the, the new standard at which will replace WebGL. And they're even investing more in WebGL itself. So suddenly we get the opportunity to really see what we can do with this, this new chip. Um, unified memory is actually interesting because in, in it can, the cost of moving data to the GPU becomes uh, eliminated. Um, you can basically ha have data in main memory and just, uh, it's a zero copy thing to, to move it to the GPU. So um, in some ways that's re more useful for games where they do a lot of back and forth copying back and forth, but we, we might find ways that we can leverage uh, that in the future, especially as we move to web GPU. There's been a few architectures already that have used unified memory. Um, AMD's GPUs for a while were using unified, unified memory. Um, really useful for compute where you might want to do a lot of compute in the GPU, but then use the results on the CPU. And one example would be like analyzing a scene to see what geometries might not be visible and then taking that visibility data, moving it back to the CPU and using it to say update physics simulations or something else which has to happen on the main, main, uh, main CPU. So uh, right now we, we've tried a few cases where we tried to do copying back and forth between GPU memory and main memory, and it just killed performance like crazy. Like it was just absolutely useless. So um, with this kind of feature, there suddenly opens up a lot of more ways we can use the GPU. Maybe a, a last question. Um, Pierre-Olivier asks, as two developers, I think it is for Pierre-Luc and, and Philip, as two developers working on platforms for virtual collaborative environments, did you experience a significant impact from COVID and post-COVID on your business opportunities? Did it push you to revise or fast track some plans or ideas? Maybe Pierre Luc and then Philip. Uh, yes, that, that's a good question. Um, I will say at first that it confirmed uh, it confirmed that we were on the right track with, uh, with at least for for uh, remote. Uh, uh, remote training, remote uh, collaborative work, and stuff like that uh, in VR with with immersive uh, with immersive experiences. Uh, we all know that how much uh, uh, Zoom stuff and uh, uh, traditional video uh, conferencing all all day long can be uh, pretty exhausting. So um, uh, so being able to to be present in, uh, remotely uh, in the in the same space and being able to collaborate uh, around an object or in a place uh, it, it can have a significant uh, uh, benefit um, and there is also uh, I think there, there there's also a, f uh, a lot of a lot of uh, use cases of new new use cases that have been uh, uh, expressed. Uh, by, by people for uh, for that kind of, of uh, product and services. So uh, so yeah, I, um, for us there there's a, there's new opportunity that that have been open. Um, also, it moved also uh, some project that we already that we already had uh, had planned before. So we had to to move some stuff. But uh, I will say that globally, uh, in in terms of the in terms of the benefit of the technology in the product itself, it's, uh, it's, been, uh, it's been positive. And I think even post COVID, there's a new emphasis on supporting remote working. So it probably could take a few years for we, us to really see the impact because um, people now are starting to invest. Okay, maybe now we're gonna build something that more supports remote, uh, you know, accessing things remotely. We're seeing a shifting in attitudes around security. Like for a while there, there was an absolute no way we would not access anything on a public cloud server. But I think we're, we're seeing that shift where companies are like, oh, well, the benefits of supporting this uh, cloud service actually is quite important. So there, there's a shift more to accepting that data is potentially served off of, of a, what we call a, you know, one of these public services like GCP, AWS, 
um, and accessed from uh, for a range of locations. So um, it's really yeah a, a more of a shift of, of accepting that this is really worth the effort and investment. In. Maybe do, do we have the time for? Oh wow, we have two last questions. That people, do you want to keep going for a few minutes, guys? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we have an anonymous attendee who asks, "Does tab part to instant to instance conversion use sort some sort of AI computation on the client end for the Z engine, or it happens completely in a backhand loader translation service?" Well, it's interesting because we we try to do it all in the back end because the idea of uh, instancing is to reduce the number of um, amount of data that we have to load in the client. And just one point is that we start off with some CAD models which looked visually identical. Like we looked at them, they looked identical, but when we put them through and analyze it, they all came up as slightly different. Sometimes different in ways that wasn't visually important, like a slight different in difference in topology. So we tried working on a fuzzy system that was like allowed to say, these things are visually close enough that we can substitute them one for the other. Um, because a purely analytical solution was kind of giving us lots of um, false negatives, I think is the term. Um, we, we don't use AI right now. It's really um, just a simple, very simple fuzzy algorithm that checks for, for, um, for congruency is the term between two geometries. Um, maybe AI would, would improve the system somewhat. We, we have tools that we can like visualize a scene. I wanted to show actually with, the, with this mining equipment, like uh, how the instancing detection has worked because we can actually see by visually color coding the geometries to see how much of the geometries was detected as identical um, versus uh, how many unique geometries. And we use it just to de debug our tools. Like if we put a huge model through and it says, oh, we detected no instances. We're like, what? We check it and yeah, these things should be instanced. They look very similar to me. Like what's wrong with our algorithm? So we go through and tune it. Um, but it, it's something, sometimes we get about 75% of the geometries can be dismissed, especially in a construction scene. There's massive amounts of duplication, which the file formats themselves can encode instancing themselves, but most of the time they don't. So we, our layer adds a new layer of instancing on top of what the file already encodes. And in construction scenes, every window cell, every door, every ladder, every everything, they're all the same geometries. Um, so. In the portafil, this scene, we actually only got about 10% reduction in geometries, like not nearly as much as we we're expecting, but it was still enough to reduce the overall number of geometries, uh, the weight of the geometries by quite a lot. And uh, the last question from Frederick, uh, what models are used for monetization? I've seen some subscription, whether they are monthly or annually and credit tokens, but I'm wondering if there are other creative approaches. That, so, yeah, we, we, um, we're offering a cloud service. We're launching the beta fairly sh soon where we allow you to use our cloud services on a subscription basis to convert your CAD files. And um, the idea is to offer services cheap and accessible, easy to use. Um, and that's that we're looking at that as, a, as the monetization strategy around allowing people to leverage our SDKs. We do a, a, a support licensing where you can license it and run it on your own in, infrastructure. Um, but that's actually much more complicated to set up and we, we are kind of looking at not just the SDK conversions but also managing the compute instances, managing booting up and shutting down compute instances. If you want to process say 100,000 files which is a normal number for the companies we're talking to, 100,000 files you need to how do you manage creating and shutting down hundreds of computers over a few days. Um, so so that, is a, that is a challenge for us that we're, we're looking to address. Uh, and, and exposing that through a simple cloud API with a subscription um, business model. Oh, we have <laughs> <laughs> questions are keep. Do, do we have time for uh, just the last one? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can't viewers are great, uh, but these seems to have a great performance. So have you considered something like a web-based CAM, CAE, which might require more resources? So uh, there's a few um, applications. There's a product called Onshape, which I'm sure, um, I think it was Nikita was ref ref thinking about. Uh, so people have been developing these web applications, which actually can do the CAD CAM modeling operations. Uh, to be honest, that's a really big complex problem. That, that is huge. Um, and uh, we're focused on what we call downstream applications. So downstream meaning everything that happens to that data 
after it's authored. Okay, so the authoring process, you know, using some sort of CAD, CAD CAM application, a big complex uh, product to, to develop. After that data has been created, there's still a lot that needs to happen to it. It needs to flow through all sorts of uh, people's hands. People need to see it, access it. So we're, we're really not focused on the upstream, but more the downstream uh, usage uh, of that data. Fantastic. Well, guys, I think we uh, this is a wrap. Thank you so much, Philip. Thank you so much, Pierre-Luc. Thank you so much, uh, Antoine, for, for, for participating. Thank you for all the attendees who, uh, who were here with us today. And if you guys want to reach out um, to, to the, any of the panelists, here you have, uh, the, um, here you have the, the contact information. And there's a lot of traffic in my street, on my street. So here you have the, all the contact information. And, if you, and thank you so much for, for being here. And uh, do not hesitate to, to contact them. And uh, see you the next time. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Have a good day. Have a good day. Bye-bye.